person uh, is that uh, uh, a futuristic approach. Now we have uh, heard about what is Kurundi and then uh, you have seen uh, what has been done now and now what, what is the future of it. Uh, by doing little little things, uh, uh, conserving a stupa, excavating an image house uh, will not help to, uh, for the uh, future because we have to some or other maintain it, manage it and present it to the future generation. That's the idea. So what I am trying to do is uh, to give you, give uh, you all an uh, idea of uh, what I have learned uh, about how are you going to manage it, what are the things that you have to identify uh, and I will just uh, try to grab certain things uh, which is uh, based on the World Heritage Management Manual and uh, I will try to give it uh, 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 an idea of uh, the officials who are responsible uh, for the future management of this site, what they have to do in future. So this is the, as you have already known, it is rich of archaeological remains, the Kikurundi. Uh, I have never been to that, they are, although I was the director general, I have seen it with photographs, these are the things that uh, they found when both they went there. And uh, these are the, uh, this is what is the desert notification. Uh, they were talking about the desert notification of declaration of Kurundi as an archaeological reserve. This is, this is the most important one of the aspects of the uh, site is that uh, according to Sri Lankan regulation law, uh, you, there are uh, several uh, types of uh, monuments, uh, sorry, uh, artifacts or uh, various things, uh, the archaeological remains uh, which we found in Sri Lanka could be categorized into uh, several uh, things according to the legislation. Uh, you, have, you know that you have, in, even in South India, you have movable and immovable artifacts. So, movable artifacts, uh, the legislation says that the movable artifacts, uh, once the regulation or the act came into power in uh, 15 July 1940, all the movable artifacts found whether it's on top of the land or beneath the land or in a lake or a river or territorial waters of Sri Lanka is owned and belongs to the state and it is owned by the Department of Archaeology. So any person who finds a movable artifact has to be, has to hand it over. But before that such date, the artifacts which were found are belongs to the people or the uh, temple, so anyone it was belongs. And when it comes to the immovable artifact, it's a different story. It says that the immovable artifacts, which is found after this act came into power, is belongs to the land owner. So if it is a private land, it is owned by that. If it is a government land, uh, belongs to the Department of Archaeology, it is belongs to the Department. If it is for a other government institution, it belongs to the other government institution. Right? And it also says that at the time of this legislation came into power, all the immovable artifacts which, which does not have an owner is belongs to the state and owned by the Department of Archaeology. And the third section is an area which is which they called as archaeological reserve. They said that it is a Puravitya Rakshite, Mata Venkala Puravitya. So it's, it's English. Uh, it's called archaeological reserve. And the archaeological reserve, it does not give a clear picture who wants it. But it says, if the Department of Archaeology wants a certain area to be declared as an archaeological reserve, they have to apply through the land commissioner. Or if the land commissioner does not agree, through the minister, uh, uh, minister in charge of the land has to gasset it and acquire it for the state. So that says that if any first uh, area has been declared as an archaeological reserve, it is owned by the state. And it is for the state, it is owned by the Department of Archaeology. And it goes little bit beyond and if, that, if, we, if there is an archaeological reserve, no one could enter or break up for cultivation 
or even penetrating that archaeological reserve without the permission of the Director General of Congress. So that gives that all the archaeological reserves, if it is declared, is owned by the Department of Archaeology and the most important part in that is there is no provision to waste it back to a certain person. So if it is declared an archaeological, that's the end of it. You can't give it back to anyone. So that is the law, at the moment law. So this Kurundi, the area, uh, has been declared in 1933, way back in 1933, as an archaeological reserve, uh, which is uh, an area which almost uh, uh, considered of 78 acres. But there is a small problem, I will show it to you. So these are the things that you see. You saw at the moment the work carried out so far. Now we will move into the proposal for the management of the Kurundi Buddhist temple. It is a Buddhist temple. You see, uh, I have to tell when I was the DG, I was called the Molotiv magistrate uh, for a dispute or a, or of a similar land uh, in the Bhavnia, uh, uh, that area, where there was a dispute. and. Uh, I was requested by various priests to tell them at the courts, declare, I say, tell uh, that place is an archaeological reserve. I said, no, I can't do it because it is not declared. This is not Kurundi, but uh, other place. Then I was called in person to the courts in, under the magistrate because as a uh, South Indian uh, delegation, you should know, the bre breach of the law of the antiquities of Sri Lanka is considered as a criminal offence in Sri Lanka. So the magistrates will look into that and you have to, when you go to the magistrate, you have to give the correct uh, legislation, otherwise you will be considered as contempt of court. So I said I can't. So, but I went there and I gave them all the evidences and all the evidences which were there, the boundaries were not clearly demarcated and various problems were there, but I told them, I was standing in the course of about two and a half hours giving evidence. Finally, I was a little bit uh, not, uh, uh, you know, I was uh, having a problem of my knees and the judge immediately understood that he asked me and then I said I have a problem in the case. He just scolded all the police people and uh, brought a chair and asked me to sit down and give evidence. That's, a, that's also, it's, he's a family judge and he was very uh, well uh, understood by Koshan. And finally, after everything was done, I stood up and all the examinations happened and I stood up and said, in any case, you can argue with any courts, but according to remains of that particular uh, area, it is a Buddhist temple. That was my discourse. You can say it is not declared an archaeological reserve. It is not declared as an ancient monument, all sorts of things. But according to the reserve. So Kurundi is also a Buddhist temple. So that is the most important part. Because it has been created as a Buddhist temple and it has been uh, venerated by Buddhist people and it has been, uh, until it uh, was neglected, it has been uh, flourish as a Buddhist temple. So you have to keep it, that in also in mind when you are doing any investigation or any management structure. And I just uh, try to give you an idea of why, what I am, my intention, uh, my ideas of the future represent. So as you know, there are nine basic characteristics, characteristics uh, of a management system. One is uh, the other, there are three elements. Three elements is you have to have a legal framework, you have to have an institutional framework, you have to have resources also. So those are the three major elements but which I consider. Then you have to have three processes. The processes are you have to do planning, you have to implement the plan. It is pointless preparing a plan and keep it shelved. You have to implement the plan. And then, while implementing, you will find new evidence. Because of that, you have to do monitoring as well. But you can't stop it at that time. That is not the uh, correct planning. Then there, there are three results. You have to measure the outcomes. 
whether you have achieved what you thought. And then you have to identify the outputs also. And while identify these three output, outputs, you will find there are differences and variances. If you find it, you have to improve the management system. So these are the nine basic elements or the nine basic characteristics that you have to follow if you are going to do a prepare a good management system for an archaeological site as Kurundi Temple. So I will use these three sections and these nine sections and I will try to give you an idea what I think that uh, the futuristic approach of this particular uh, institutions they, ha they have to do. The three elements is legal from, uh, framework, that is the basic of it, which defines the reasons for existence. And then the institutional framework, which gives from, uh, from to, uh, form uh, to its organizational needs and decision making. And then you have to f uh, uh, find the resources, uh, that is, as you know, human, most important financial, without financial option. Now, uh, they said that uh, although every, uh, the Department of Archaeology, uh, as soon as the, uh, the uh, war was over, this area was identified, but until the Baudaloka Foundation came forward and provided the financial resources, they couldn't do anything. So financialists, and then the intellectual, because if you find the human resources and financial resources, it's, it's, uh, it's pointless. You have to have intellectual resources, how you carry the scientific excavation, scientific conservation, that's why the, the uh, senior professor Malinga Amarasinghe got involved and various other scholars, so you have to find the intellectual proposal also. So legal fra uh, framework, you see that this is the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, which I took it from the archaeological reserve of the uh, the, uh, the, in the uh, department website. And this is the Gazette notification uh, that you will see in uh, Kurundi, but according to this, there are three Gazette notification, which is in the same thing. So there are three areas, and when you add these three areas, it comes to 78 acres, two routes, and 13 perches. So now, even in all the uh, text in the web, you will see, uh, Kurundi and adjoining temple has been gazetted as an archaeological resource. So what then you have to differentiate because if you are going to manage, you have to have clear boundaries. Otherwise, you can't. You don't know. No. So now Vasana said that according to this, that they have measured and identified the boundaries. So first you have to do is uh, there are four, uh, three lots, four lots. Uh, the boundaries has to be clearly defined uh, first, and if they have done, then the next important thing which came into my mind is you have a clear boundary. You can preserve it, but what happens to the adjoining area? You have to protect it also, because you know that when it goes to World Heritage Site, you have to have a buffer zone. If you don't have a buffer zone, what will happen there? around the area, around it, will get ruined. So you have to do it. But according to the antiquities ordinance, if there is an archaeological reserve, you can't identify a boundary. You, have, you can't give a boundary to that, sorry, buffer zone to that archaeological reserve. The only legislative uh, power of the uh, boundary uh, which is in the antiquities ordinance is only for the ancient monuments. So ancient monument, a certain distance from the ancient monument, ancient monument includes the land where the ancient monument is situated as well. It says in the uh, interpretation. So from the boundary you can declare a certain area as a preserved or buffer zone. In, uh, so as soon as you identify it, you will identify the monuments. Ancient monument is a monument or a building or a structure, but Sri Lankan law, it's different. In 1988 amendment, 98 amendment, Dr. Daranikal specifically inserted to the, uh, the interpretation of the ancient monument is also he has included a 
an area where you could identify archaeological remains or activities also could be gazetted as an ancient monument. That means not only a building, a, an area which consists of several buildings also could be gazetted as an ancient monument. So then my uh, suggestion to the department is after identify the boundaries, you can gasset that particular Kurundi temple, the entire area as an ancient monument. Once you gasset as ancient monuments, it says in that section a certain distance from that ancient monument, you could gasset an area where the development activities of all entire area has to be could be controlled by the Director General of Archaeology. If a person residing in that area, that buffer zone, after it's gasseted, if he wants to develop his house or land, then he has to apply permission from the Director General of Archaeology. So Kurundi Vihare, uh, after you identify the archaeological reserve, my proposal is to gasset it as an ancient monument and there uh, after gasset the buffer sto uh, zone uh, as. Then after gasset in the buffer zone and the, uh, the ancient monument, then you can gasset the regulations and standing orders to govern this particular entire area. So then what will happen, this entire area not could be, it would be the development of the entire area could be controlled, uh, not prohibit, because it says not prohibiting in the regulation, it says you will uh, in give certain regulations and control that area, how the development could be done, what are the heights and what are the ports, uh, uh, sorry, development areas and what is the angle of the roofs and all those could be gazetted. So what I am asking, uh, I am, I am uh, telling that the department now step into that and according to the lean vehicle framework, uh, framework you have to do these things. Then you, when it, once you gasset and identify the area, you have to have a, some kind of framework to control uh, that area. The institutional framework, what at the moment, as I told you, it's an archaeological reserve. And it is owned by the Department of Archaeology. So Department of Archaeology have all the uh, regulations, all the, everything, all the powers in the world to control it. But Department of Archaeology, since it is a department, it cannot be it cannot do this alone, as in the case of uh, when they wanted to do the conservation, they have to get the financial support from someone else. So what the, then the, uh, this Kurindi temple also has been declared uh, and identified as a registered Buddhist temple uh, by the uh, Department of Buddhist Affairs. So now you have another uh, person also. Uh, uh, came into the picture, not only the Department of Archaeology, uh, the uh, chief priest of the Kurindi Buddhist temple is also here, so now he is also in this game now. Not only that, there are villagers and there are interested parties around it. So you have to get a, as uh, like the uh, the Bauda Loka Padanama, they are also interested. And the Buddhist communities are interested. Maybe the villages around. And there may be uh, various politicians and others around. They had a lot of conflicts last year. So we have to get hold of everyone and come to consensus and to have a kind of a uh, management uh, formula of all these incorporating all these parties, that is the best solution, what I think at the moment. Then, uh, so because of that, uh, what I think, so uh, you have to create an institution uh, sufficiently defined in relation to wider governance co governance co context, and then responsible, flex, uh, flex, flexible, responsible and flexible to cope with emerging concept, because there are various ideas in this. Uh, uh, of course, our professor, senior professor Malinga Amar Singh also expresses the, uh, the uh, problems that he has faced while doing this research work. Uh, and the trends and requirements, there are requirements of the people, requirement of the uh, uh, Buddhists who are using this and so all those has to be. Then organization, uh, decentralization, 
uh, when then decision making has to be done and uh, there will be problems so you have to identify problems and cope up the situations uh, and uh, uh, then to promote suitable approaches so these things has to be considered while making a institution there which will govern this particular uh, site so that's my uh, proposal for that then you have to have resources human resources uh, well it is uh, under the department of archaeology uh, and it is the responsibility of the department of archaeology since they own it so they have to provide uh, human resources under uh, their public management but you have to outsource this also uh, as they have already done uh, to obtain expertise evidence and expertise uh, get involved uh, uh, work from others and uh, then you have to uh, get the help of wider range of professionals uh, and also sometimes you might have to do some work that you may not be able to do because you have to hire, hire contractors sometimes so all those things has to be uh, considered while managing it so you have to provide human resources and then uh, financial resources as you know it is owned by the department uh, of archaeology and it is owned to the state and it is the responsibility of the state to provide at least certain type of resources from the government budget so that the department of archaeology has to request from the uh, uh, finance ministry while preparation of the uh, government uh, budgets in each, each year you have to identify certain allocation uh, for the management of this particular because once it is uh, conserved once it is excavated uh, and you have to maintain it otherwise it will come go back to the same situation you have uh, uh, so the, it is the responsibility of the government because it is on uh, recently I heard uh, the honorable uh, president was telling to the Department of Archaeology if we owns if the government owns a certain land it is the duty of the government to provide financial resources he was telling uh, even to the director general at a uh, uh, meeting and it should not stop at that time we always know government always finds it's very difficult to um, uh, provide financial resources to manage the entire uh, archaeological resources in the entire country so you have to obtain uh, funds from other sources like uh, or maybe various donors so you have to advocate and uh, um, them and get some funding from them. and also after doing this all work you have to think in terms of generating uh, financial resources from the property itself now when you go to South India in, in, there are a lot of even the Department of Archaeology uh, finds if you go to Mahabalipurum you have to pay so but here there's a differences of this uh, entrance fees but when you go to India also there is a difference but when you go to other for, for natives it is a different uh, uh, and uh, uh, entrance fees and for the uh, foreigners it, uh, it's a different um, uh, entrance fee but here it's a it is little bit uh, more than that because some of these uh, monuments are still venerated then for veneration how are you going to uh, impose a entrance fee uh, for the uh, people who are venerating so it's a it's an argument it will have a problem so we have to think in terms of anyway it's very difficult but you have to have some kind of uh, financial resources uh, generated from the directly from the site so you have to think in terms of that also so uh, then when it comes to inter, inter, in, uh, intellectual resources uh, so you have to reinforce it uh, through in, uh, internal monitoring review uh, external sources you have to identify uh, then information management uh, our storting and advocacy all those has to be considered in finding right intellectual uh, resources uh, to manage this which is required uh, to manage this site so this is uh, the uh, the first uh, three systems then after finding everything legal then you create an institution and you find the resources then you have to step into the uh, the processes the processes is planning implementation and monitoring you have to plan 
you have to plan a, you have to prepare a plan which could be actually operational so for that uh, you have to identify the stakeholders and you have to collect information and the you have to identify the and characterize the uh, heritage uh, and you have to analyze the color current situation then you have to set your visions objectives and actions of the plan uh, so then after that you have to draft the plan uh, then you have to implement review and update the plan as well as so we you know there are various planning principles uh, which you could follow in the world one is the strategic planning strategic planning is a plan that you will prepare for a larger institution but this is a site so site management if you are trying to uh, draw up a plan uh, to manage the site it should be based on the actual values of the site so we have to identify what are the values of the site first so what are the values whether it's a historical value whether it's a user value whether it's archaeological value whether it's a, a different type of uh, emotional value we have to identify the series of values and then you have to prepare the actions or, or uh, the things that you have to do in according in, in accordance to safeguard the values that you have identified and enhance these values identified into the particular site and then present it for the future generation so if you identify a plan to safeguard these values then you will be well off and the plan could be uh, operated so uh, then for the korin kurundi vihare i am also i am proposing uh, to identify the values and then draw up a five year plan when you draw, draw up a five year management plan and it could be revised from time to time now in in sri lanka we always advocate, uh, advocate to have a five year plan what should we have to do so it is very easy if you prepare a five year plan with all the objectives values and everything then you can apply for the government funding also which i have done uh, several uh, times in 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 sri lanka uh, after identifying the values and value based five year plan i i did submitted a, a similar plan to the government and in uh, 2015 they allocated 268 million for that site because the plan was done on the value based and recently i updated that plan and requested an extension and the government has allocated 340 million additional funds starting from the next year so if you prepare a good plan even you can submit it to the government uh, finance ministry and get your funding Uh, then you have to identify regular work plans in this particular land and long term strategic plans also you can identify and uh, after identifying the plans then you have to have set aside resources uh, that is required the staff and other resources that you need to uh, continue this particular plan <coughs> then after getting all the money and everything then you have to implement it so kurundi vihare after preparing a five year management plan and after identify all the uh, all the people and the others who are going to execute then you have they have to the institution that has been created there has to start implementing this plan so with broad, broad participation and recording and reporting and you when you app, uh, uh, when you are uh, implementing plan you have to give responsibilities to each and every person who has art, uh, um, uh, who works in that institution from the top to bottom until the until to the uh, maybe the um, uh, the security person who will be uh, uh, in in place in that particular site so you have to divide responsibilities and give it to them and with targets you have to do it, do it 
So this in institution has to uh, do, do it with the supervision and it sh should be continuous monitoring. And when actually when I was uh, given the task by the former director general, our Senator Disanayaka to uh, implement the plan in the Jaffna fort, uh, we were, I, I, I was uh, uh, going to Jaffna uh, to monitor the execution of the plan once in every two weeks. So I was there from, uh, uh, well, 2009 March, uh, March to 2011 uh, uh, December, I was working with, in their plan with, with uh, resources provided by the Netherlands government as well as, as from the government. I have visited the site about 64 times. Because monitoring is very much important when the implementation stage. You have to go and see whether the plan is working and what are the problems, whether is it so. Uh, likewise, uh, after uh, preparing this plan, implementation of the institution, uh, the press specialist has to get together and do a monitoring or uh, you have to normally what we say, uh, the, uh, the site uh, uh, monitoring plan or site meetings has to be carried out with the people who are implementing it. And then uh, you have to collect the data and it, uh, you have to place a mechanism of collecting data, maybe measuring length, breadth and depth of the work that you do and then calculate it and see whether you have an, the people who are there has done it efficiently and effectively. So you have to find the solution. So I have been given various tasks and things like that. During the meeting we measure we are request the people who are there to give their uh, efficiency of the people working as well as the, uh, the effectivity also. also. So we, you have to monitor it. And so uh, for that also, you have to identify clear personnel and individuals. Uh, and the important thing is the persons who are been handling this plan has to ensure accountability and also transparency. It is very, very important, accountability and transparency while you are implementing a plan. So you have to keep this also in mind. You have to have a mechanism uh, to check these things also. So it's very important in this. Then finally, monitoring. Monitoring is also uh, define the purpose of objectives of monitoring. And then you have to collect the database, maybe daily, um, uh, results, maybe weekly results, maybe monthly results. You have to identify it and see whether it's going according to plan that you have uh, formula. So it, you have to uh, provide a monitoring plan in place and then uh, you have to continue the monitoring practices. Uh, you have to gather data. This data will help to keep track on your um, plan, uh, the eff effectivity of the plan and then assess the systematically and then uh, go forward by monitoring it. And then finally you come to this the results. After doing all those things you have to identify the results, the outcomes, the outcomes whether the management system is achieving objectives. So you have identified the objectives. You have to check whether these are achieving and indicators has to be uh, built into the, uh, the, uh, into the system. Uh, then the, during the planning process, the outcome indicators has to be achieved. Now, as I told you, if you are submitting a five-year plan for the government uh, to obtain financial resource, they will uh, request you to key KPIs, key performance indicators. You have to identify that the planning stage. What, how are you going to measure your outcomes through the, whether you are uh, conserving uh, a particular type of monuments, whether you are conserving the artifacts that you have found, whether you are uh, identifying certain people to visit in this particular uh, place given time, whether these people are coming or venerating. And maybe the, uh, the Buddhist uh, uh, priest will f perform certain functions. Now, for example, when we went to Polonnaruwa in 19, uh, we started the cultural triangle project. None of the Buddhist temp uh, temples which we identified in Polonnaruwa uh, was having any sort of religious activities. 
No ceremonies were performed, nothing was there when we started in 1983. But Dr. Olin Silva requested the priest, oh, if you don't have uh, resources to play for the drummers, pray for the, uh, pay for the uh, people who are preparing the arms and things like that. The CCF will meet their salaries. You get hold of the people, we will revive these performances. And then gradually it was performed and now if you go to Polonnaru or if you go to uh, other places also, you will see that religious performances are well performed. So it was like that. You have to identify uh, these things also in, in Kurundu Vihare also. You might uh, have uh, uh, KPIs uh, placed at the start of the performances like that. <coughs> then outputs. Outputs also, uh, you have to uh, identify the physical outputs and then the volume of work that we are going to do and the users, people who will come there uh, from time to time, uh, this has to be identified. And then you have to see whether these outputs uh, of uh, physical outputs uh, like excavations, conservation and various things, whether you are doing it correctly and these outputs have uh, uh, achieved during the time period that you have given and if not, what are the reasons and how we are going to, whether you have to revise it, like that you have to identify the physical outputs and the volume of work also you are doing and the specialty the users. Because uh, we feel that uh, 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 this type of uh, ancient Buddhist monument uh, will not survive with the people, with the users. There may be users in uh, different ways, there may be people who are venerating it. There may be people who will come there uh, as a, as a, um, a, 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 to see the site. There may be people who will come there and use the place and uh, stay in the place and do this uh, type of uh, various functions and things like that. So you have to identify various people. Maybe they are school children. Maybe uh, the researchers from the universities, maybe uh, uh, people coming from uh, other parts of the world. So all those has to be identified and uh, the users also you have to identify. So after identifying these outputs and outcomes, I, we know that what will happen, these plans has to be improved according to the, uh, the outcomes and outputs that you have. Uh, develop whether they are achieving. So, uh, achieve outcome effectively. Are you effectively achieving these outcomes? And the three elements and three processes and uh, provided support also. If they are not achieved, then good management must make changes. This is the most important thing. Because when you prepare a plan, it is not the final, it is not static. You have to, because you are thinking in, uh, in a futuristic approach. It's your imagination. You are at this situation, you are going to a different situation. While on the path, going in the path, you will have different uh, scenarios and different uh, problems and things like that you will find. So all those things you have to uh, assess and then finally uh, you have to revise the management plan. That is the final part and it will be an on ongoing process after five years. Uh, within the, during the course of the five years, you might have to revise wh while you are doing it or after five years you have to revise it. As I did, I told you that five year plan was prepared to site and it was, uh, government gave us 263 million and it was revised last year and submitted to the government and government get 340 million additional because it, it was, we have uh, shown them the outputs, outcomes, everything and the future. So this is what uh, my thing, so these nine components of uh, this management system uh, has to be uh, uh, formulated in Kurundi and then uh, this, uh, 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 the framework uh, reference who use it, heritage practitioners who manage the properties has to get together and the policy makers who define the institutional framework and then uh, communities and networks who to be involved in the heritage uh, and also need the transparency over how the decisions are making made. So this is one of the most important sections. When you do a, make a decision, it should be transparent and it should be communicated for all the people 
who are involved in this management of this particular site. From that onwards, you will be able to achieve this uh, framework. Uh, so uh, the management of cultural heritage, uh, the functions, uh, defining the documentation heritage management system, communicating how it works, and place each heritage concern in a broad constraint, illustrate the needs of an integrated approach. It should be an integrated approach. That's the most important thing in this uh, management plan. Then framework for assessing and improving a heritage management system also to be formulated in this management plan. So this is what I feel that uh, since uh, they have uh, made, uh, they have uh, spent a lot of resources as well as they have made certain efforts. Uh, the, they said, uh, the Vasana and they said how they went there uh, as soon as the war was over. And now uh, Professor Malinga Amarasinghe uh, showed you what they have done. So in future, this is what you have to do. So these three elements, at SI uh, principle, legal framework, institutional and resources, then pre-processors, planning, implementation, and monitoring, and the three results, outcomes and outputs and improvements, has to find, uh, to identify, protect, conserve, and keep uh, as long as possible of this Kurundi without any destruction. So that should be your final achievement by using available limited resources. We know that the resources are very limited, so you have to do it using the uh, 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 limited resources. How effectively and efficiently? These are the two main words uh, that you have to keep in your mind and it is, should be done through scientific management principles and processes. So thank you very much for your attention.